Hope you're all well. Thanks for braving it out on a bank holiday Monday. I forgot to tell people it was bank holiday Monday evening, so I just thought I'll just carry on regardless. And as I say to someone else, what else would you be doing anyway? So, you know, um, I'm sure my wife would have had some fun to do somewhere. What, what, could, what could we have done? Resting? Doing nothing? <coughs> yeah, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just open in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for tonight, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, um, for the joy and the privilege it is and the honour it is to be able to be in a form of leadership within your church, Lord God. And I pray tonight, Lord, you'll just uh, help me to convey your heart to people, Lord God, and I pray that people will come away uh, blessed and built up in their faith tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> So there's a few things I want to clarify. Firstly, tonight is Monday, and so on Mondays I like to wear my uh, cult leader shirt, just so that you, in case anyone was wondering, because uh, I get accused of all kinds of things. Uh, what, what do I get accused of, Trace? Um, being a cult leader, uh, a false prophet, what? Apocalyptic, the Antichrist. Um, I've been called all sorts of things. Even this week, I come up in some f- like there's like on big famous sort of like uh, prophetic forums that Chris Wick they talk to me out like that. Chris Wickland, he doesn't play with us. He doesn't, you know, he 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 distances himself from us. And I'm like, but you never gave me an invite to come and play with you. I said, chew me out. I've done done nothing wrong, and I get chewed out. But as I said the other day, you know, if you can't if you can't uh, take the heat, then don't sit in a seat. So um, you'll get that. When you get into leadership, you'll get people that love you, people that hate you, and uh, that's just the way it is. Um, but there we go. I wanted to also clarify a few things that I'd said from last, last time. Can you all hear me all right, by the way? Yeah. And uh, I said, one of the things I said was, as, as leaders, we're not, co- we're not to be, um, uh, what's the word? Can't, no, no, nice. We're not to be nice. Thank you. Whoever shouted that out, see, they got it. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean we, we, we're not to be kind. I just want to emphasize that. We're not horrible to people. We're not merciless. So I have to be kind to people. But, but being nice is, is not challenging people, for example, when they maybe need to be challenged because you just don't want to upset them. Um, but actually, sometimes the kindest thing to do is to tell them something they don't want to hear but because it will actually help them. So you, so you get the difference between nice and kind. Yeah. So that's important. And also, as leaders, it's also important to be, as, even, even if you do have to be kind and say something you don't want to say, it's always important to do it gently and with respect. Yeah? Uh, don't go in with all guns blazing. Uh, secondly, people are people, and they'll choose how they wish to respond. So some people will respond well, some people will respond badly when they're challenged, and that's just life. And there's not a lot you can do about it either. Um, and some people will respond badly, then come back and say, "Actually, thanks for that. I needed that." Or you know, I don't think it's ever happened to me yet. But um, <laughs> but um, no, generally most people are okay. Um, also, I was talking about opinions, if you disagree with something. Again, that could have come across as quite control freak, like, you disagree with me. Um, but what I mean is, so like on, on secondary issues, we can, we can disagree on things. So, for example, some people might say, uh, well, I think you should baptize people only in the name of Jesus. And other people might say, I, should, I think you, can only, you should only baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, they're what I call, well, someone might think they're, they're really primary issues, but they're not primary issues, they're secondary issues, because that's not what gets you saved. Although probably some would argue that it would be something that gets you saved. Mm, yeah, we could, we could debate that. Anyway, um, so, so that's probably a bad example. Uh, communion. Is it transubstantiation, consubstantiation? Is it presence only or memory only? Okay, we could all have bun fights about that till the cows come home, and it would be really fun to see. But they're secondary issues, and so you know everyone can have an opinion on that, and we're not going to ram it down people's throats about that either. So, um, and uh, so, so because what we don't want to be is div- di- divisive in all that we do, uh, and also as a church to all our leaders. We do have a doctrinal statement, so anyone that joins as a, uh, as a deacon, they get a, a, a reasonably detailed analysis of what we believe as a church. But if you're an elder, you get like the full Monty version of what we believe as a church, because it, so that you know as a, as, an, as a leader, as an elder, you don't want to accidentally walk on a landmine. You know? So if you're, if you're in a Calvinist church, you don't want to be talking about you know, free will and all that kind of stuff, because it just wouldn't go down well. <laughs> so it's good to know what kind of church you're in and what they stand for and stuff. So that's, that's why we do that. And, uh, and also, why even be a church leader? So I've come across as quite strong.
strong and gruff over these sessions, only because I'm trying to give you a, a more balanced look at what leadership is like. It can be quite grim sometimes, and that's something that's never taught, I don't think. And you go to these leadership conferences, and it's all great, and how to manage people, and all this kind of stuff, and all the books on leadership. They, they don't really address the issues that I, I talk about. And so uh, it's not that I'm a gruff. It's actually it's an honor to be in church leadership because ultimately we're serving God by serving the people. Okay, So it is a privilege and it is an honor. But it's good to come into that kind of work with eyes wide open you know, rather than, I don't know. Anyway, so tonight I'm going to look at a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to give you a little introduction into covenant theology. <laughs> It's not boring, okay? I'll try not to make you fall asleep. But also, then we're going to look at things like prayer ministry as well, just like a real basic primer. Um, and I think what we'll do later on in the year as well, I'm going to run a course, a, a prayer ministry course, but in that how to deal with the demonic and things like that, okay? So, you know, but Jackie, you with us? I thought you were asleep then. I thought I, I, thought I, was, I was just joking. It's like, uh, covenant theology is not that boring, really. Um, yeah, so if anyone will be up for that, I'll advertise that later on in the year. Okay, right, you're sitting comfortably. So we've got one more week next week is, is another kind of me lecturing, and after that it's practical, okay? And then I won't record them anymore because you won't want to be seen by lots of other people because uh, that wouldn't be very fair for you. So uh, tonight <coughs> we're going to look a little bit about covenant theology. Now, why, why is this important? Because I think it's really important to understand the basic tenets of the Christian faith, okay? So, i.e. salvation, justification, uh, adoption, sanctification, glorification, okay? As well as the six foundational doctrines in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Let us not lay again the doctrine, of, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head actually, but, you know, and the laying on of hands and the doctrine of baptisms and eternal judgment and the resurrection of the dead, all that kind of stuff. So they're, they're what I would say every Christian must know. And um, there is some good um, discipleship programs out there which do cover some of that stuff, but then there's a lot that don't. And so the issues of salvation, I find a lot of Christians... Now, I don't believe personally in once saved, always saved. That's just my personal opinion, so I'm not going to argue about that. <coughs> um, and, and def, but even so... I st my needle still hovers around 90%. Like, you've really got to do something serious in my books to be able to knock yourself out of that. But nevertheless, having an understanding of God's salvation will stop you from fearing things that you shouldn't even be fearing. You know, have I lost my salvation because I did this today or all that? You know, like for example, I mean, I get this a lot. So what about the big topic? I guess come to me like t today the other day, I was reading it. I was like, oh, of course, yeah. So I've done a lot of studying on the issue of of divorce and remarriage. And there are some Christians like, if you remarry someone and that, and that person hasn't been, you know, which the other person's died, then it's like an unforgivable sin and you'll go to hell because you're, you're in adultery and therefore you will die in adultery. Yeah, you know, when Jesus met the woman at the well, he still got her saved and she'd been married five times. And the guy she was with now wasn't even married to. And it's like, well, Jesus didn't have a problem with her getting saved, even though the fact that she'd had five husbands and now she was... I mean, obviously, he must have challenged her, like, you need to sort this out in some way. We'd, we'd probably get that. But even so, five husbands, it's like, pff, mate, which, you know, does that mean she's committed adultery with these five different men and all, all the theological implications? So you see what I'm saying? So this is where we can get into all these theological knots if we don't understand certain basic principles. So we get into what I call secondary issues, and then they cloud our primary issues, and that's when people start worrying about their salvation and various other things. And if you as a church leader, I'm sorry if I've upset people by what I just said there. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, that's off a bit of a landmine I've just walked into there. And some people are like, well, I completely disagree. But what I'm saying is it's that uh, sometimes we might think we would lose our salvation over something that actually the Bible doesn't indicate that that's the case. Um, and it, maybe adultery was a bad example. Um, but, but nevertheless, understanding now, I'm just, I'm just digging myself a hole now. Everyone watching this is going to be like, man, we're going to get a thousand comments now. Are you saying that you can be in adultery and be saved? And I say, oh, for goodness sake. You know what I'm saying. Just leave me alone. Okay. Leave the hate. Anyway, that's just leave me. Uh, so salvation, justification. What does that mean? Adoption, sanctification, glorification. These are like really core basic stuff that we need to know as Christians. And if you as leaders don't understand these things and are walking in these things and have a good groundwork and framework of it, it will affect you as a leader. And then whether you like it or not, it will seep out of you into everything else that you do. 
So if you are a person that doubts your salvation, for example, quite periodically, that's going to come out in your teaching. So even though you might think you're saying all the right words, but people will pick up on it. It's weird. It's so weird. And then they will end up suffering with the same problem that you've got. And so it is, it's weird. And so if you as a leader are strong in yourself, and you're strong in God, and, and you're assured in, in your identity in God, um, there's a confidence that comes out of you, and that is picked up by everybody else, and that helps them as well, yeah? Um, you know, as that sums it, um, when brothers dwell together in unity, it's like the oil coming down uh, Aaron's beard and down the garments. It's always like that, forgive me using a Pentecostal analogy, but the anointing oil of God coming from the head and then coming down upon all of us. So, you know, the oil comes from Christ and the Holy Spirit onto us and onto us all, but it also works like that in leadership, like in headship in the, in the household, through the father and to the wife and the children and through, through church leadership into the congregation. Not that the congregation don't have access to the holy oil of God and all that kind of stuff, but there is something in it. And therefore, if as leaders you're walking in things of God and you have that flow of God in your life, it affects everybody in a good and positive way. Okay, uh, And that's why I think as leaders we uh, are to be judged more the harshly, as it says in James, um, because you know, we will be held accountable for things that we do and that we say. So undergirding good doctrinal foundations uh, is another foundation which I feel is often overlooked. Uh, and this, of course, is the doctrine of covenant. And if, I think if you understand the doctrine of covenant, it really just helps pull everything together. And so I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Because obviously anyone who knows anything about covenant knows that it starts right back in, right in the Garden of Genesis, uh, in the Garden of Eden, and works its way right through to the book of Revelation. Okay, so covenant is a continual weaving thread that goes throughout the whole Bible. And so one of the things that you need to understand about covenant is that God has chosen to make one with you and me, with us, okay? We didn't instigate this covenant. God instigated this covenant. Now, when you start to think like that, it's like, that's exciting, right? This wasn't something I worked up. This wasn't something I begged and pleaded for. This was something that God instigated, not just whilst I'm alive, but it says he did it before the foundations of the earth because it says in Revelation 4, Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. So God already cut covenant through his son, the lamb that was to be sacrificed for all the world. That's amazing, isn't it? It says in Peter that the cross was established again before the foundation of the earth as well. I mean, this stuff just blows your mind. It's like, what? How is that even possible? But it is. Hallelujah. So let's not worry about it. Um, here's, and also what's good is that God chose to do this not based on any merit that we had done. You know, nothing you've done. And none of this foreknowledge nonsense as well. Well, God knew you were going to be a really good person, so you deserved it. Yeah, because if that's the case, he really didn't know what I was up to when I was young, because I really didn't deserve it. I mean, anyone thinks his stuff through, it's just like, that's a load of rubbish, okay? Um, so, and that argument, incidentally, is brought out in Romans 9, where it says to uh, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And it says, God chose them before they'd done anything good or bad. So it wasn't dependent on their works, but it was dependent on the grace of God. Okay, now I know that raises some questions, full knowledge and, and predestination. We're not going to go down that road tonight, if ever, um, because it just, it's, just, it's a fun argument to have. But, it, but nevertheless, one of the things you just need to simply come to the conclusion is that God has chosen you, and he has decided to cut covenant with you and with me. Okay, when you start to begin to think these things, it makes you excited, like, no, yeah, God cut covenant with me. No matter how much of an idiot I am, and I was even more of an idiot before I knew him, okay, and he chose to cut covenant with me then, and even now as a Christian, I'm not quite as much an idiot then, but when I do stupid things, he still loves me, and he still, still wants to keep this covenant relationship going, because he chose to cut covenant with me when I was a real idiot, amen? So let that be an encouragement to the idiots in the room. Um, anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. You're not idiots. You're all good, lovely people. Amen. So, um, God has chosen and elected to cut covenant with man because of his grace and his unmerited favor towards us. We didn't earn it. We never deserved it. So the starting point of covenant is election and God's grace. Now, I'm just going to give you a couple of Hebrew words, or a couple of key words here. So in the Old Testament, the word for grace is chesed, about C H E S E D, you know, pronounced as Chesed, Chesed, um, and the, the word denotes grace, loving kindness, and mercy. 
Okay. Now that word, <coughs> no one has access to God's chesed unless they're in a covenant relationship with him. Okay. The Old Testament is absent. And this is, this is what annoys me about Christians. I don't read my Old Testament because that's all done away with. Well, you're undoing a, con- a key component of understanding of the nature of covenant. Because you're not going to find it so much in the New Testament. You'll find it rooted in the Old Testament. And if you understand the full nature of covenant from the Old Testament perspective, man, it makes the New Testament covenant perspective even better. All right? And so you cannot have this covenantal favor of God unless you are in relationship with him by covenant. And so one of the, I'd say, errors of today's Christianity is that we're in the age of grace, brothers. Everybody comes under the grace of God. And it's like, yes, we're all, there's all degrees of grace there in the sense of God lets the sun shine on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God lets the unrighteous people have, have wives and husbands and they can have children. That's a blessing of God. It's, it's a form of grace. But it's what I call residual background grace, like background radiation. That's there for all mankind. But God's covenantal favor grace is not available to all mankind. It is only available to those who have had covenant kind of cut covenant with almighty god okay so this whole age of grace thing since the cross god doesn't do this anymore because we're in the age of grace no that covenantal favor is only uh, bestowed upon those who choose to accept him where are you getting that from the bible well romans three sixteen. for god so loved the world that he gave up his only son that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life yes amen brother hallelujah but have you read 17 and 18 But those that do not accept him have condemned themselves and are already therefore condemned. So they're not under that covenantal favor and grace of God. Okay. So in the New Testament, there's another word for grace, which is uh, charis. Uh, Everyone heard of that? Charis? Yeah. That's where the word charismata comes from or charismatic. So charismata means gifts of grace. So charismatic gifts are gifts of grace. You don't deserve it. We didn't earn it, but God's given it to us anyway for the building up and the edification of this church. Hallelujah. Um, so let's have a quick look at God cutting covenant with somebody. So if, we, uh, if you've got a Bible, we're going to look at Genesis 17. I left my Bible at home, so I'm going to have to use this NLT. In case anyone wants to send me some hate mail about that. Uh, Genesis 17 verses 1 to 8. Seriously. Um, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abraham fell face down on the ground. And then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. Okay, I want you to listen very carefully to this language because it's relevant to you as well. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Okay, this, the word there for nations is goyim in the Hebrew, or in the Greek it's ethnos, ethnicity, so that's where the word Gentile comes from. What's more, I'm changing your name. It will no longer be Abraham, instead you'll be called Abraham, for you will be father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants. And I'll give the entire land of Canaan where you now live as as a foreigner to you and your descendants, and it will be their possession forever and ever, and I will be their God. Okay. So this is known as the Abrahamic Covenant. Now, if we now jump over, now everyone who reads that generally thinks, well, that's for the Jews. Okay, well, there are certain parts of that covenant which are. So the descended, direct descendants of Abraham, the land, i.e. Israel, is their possession. Um, we've looked at that in our course that we did on the biblical importance of Israel. And it's also a book that I wrote, which you can get off Amazon for like six pounds. Thank you very much. So if you turn to Galatians 3, verses 11 to 22... So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the Torah. For the scripture says, it is through faith that a person is made righteous. This way of faith is very different from the way of the Torah, which says, it is through obeying the Torah that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the Torah when he was hung on a cross. Does anyone know what the curse of the Torah is? 
Okay, for those that don't, it's Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through to 68, and it lists all the terrible diseases and the afflictions and terrible things that will come upon you if you don't obey the Torah. Okay, um, for, and it says, when he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. So Jesus embodied in himself the whole curse of the Deuteronomic law, okay, so that you and I don't have to be cursed by the Torah. So that's good news, right? For it is written uh, in, in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. And through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Uh, where are we up to now? So... Um, to 22. There's quite a lot here, but there's so much good stuff here. Verse 16, God gave the promises to Abraham and his child, and notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if, meant, as if he meant to say by many descendants, rather it says to his child, or your translation, seed, and that of course means Christ. This is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be cancelled out 430 years later when God gave the Torah to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the Torah, then it would be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Why then was the Torah given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the Torah was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his Torah through angels to Moses, uh, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham, because he is the mediator, which is uh, Jesus the Son. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the Torah could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we're all prisoners of sin, and so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. So a few things to get from that is that the Abrahamic covenant is yours as much as it is to the Jew. Now, the Jew has certain stipulations that you and I don't have. We don't get access to inherit the land. But you and I get all access to all the other promises. So, blessed are you when... Uh, sorry, um, those that bless you are blessed, and those that curse you are cursed. That applies just as much to the church as it does to the Jew. Why? Because you are engrafted into the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? It is yours as much as it is to them. Um, there's a few other scripts here, shorter ones, that I can just go to prove my point. Um, so verse 29 says, And now that you belong to Christ, you are the, the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. I could make it any clearer than that. That's in scripture. It's in black and white. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and verses 13 and 14 as well. That same chapter. Uh, which is, but Christ has rescued us from the curse of the law. Yeah, sort of that, yeah, so that's good. So because now through Christ we are co-heirs with Abraham of the promises that were given to Abraham, okay? I did another book called The, um, the Blessing of Abraham. It's also six pound on Amazon. And that actually breaks that whole covenant down and cho ch tells you what your covenant at, um rights are as a believer in Christ. In fact, I actually cut loads of it out because it was too good to be true that I thought people would not believe this if they actually knew just how good it was. So I, I kept a lot of it out. And what I did keep in there is, is amazing. It is amazing what God has given to the church as well as to the Jew. And uh, sadly, most Christians are completely oblivious to that covenantal blessings that we have and we don't really walk in it. So... Uh, where are we? Um, yeah, so we are members of the Abrahamic covenant and its blessings. Both Jewish and Gentile believers are now one new man in Christ. Um, not Jews and Gentiles, but Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Now, when it gets to that scripture, it says you're one new man in Christ, which says there is, no, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no male, there is no female, there is no slave, there is no free. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Because clearly... When you get to heaven, we, as I've discussed before, there are ethnicities in heaven, because it says so in Revelation. It says, the glory of the nations comes into the new Jerusalem, and the, and the twelve fruits of the tree of life, for the healing of the nations. So nations are obviously still relevant in heaven, so it's like, so what does it mean? What it means is, there's no first or second class citizens in God's kingdom. A Jew cannot be considered 
um, a first-class citizen and a Gentile, a second-class. A male can't be considered first-class, female, second-class. Free man, first-class, slave, second-class. What it's saying is, in Christ, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no male, there is no female, there is no slave, there is no free, because you're all one, one new man in Christ. Okay? There is no class system when it comes to the things of the kingdom of heaven. All right? And I'm sure that will raise some more theological questions, but we can leave that for another time. But it is... Yes, yeah, basically, yeah. God's, God has no favourites. Which, which Romans teaches that God favours no man, uh, apart from some. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, that's Animal Farm, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, um, this is also compounded by the fact that, that there are no longer Jews and Gentiles for those who believe in Messiah. Yeah, there's, there's other scriptures I can give. I don't want to go into all that because that can be a bit boring. Um, so, but we are grafted into the covenants of Israel and thus have full covenant status and all the blessings that apply to the seed of Abraham, i.e. the promises to the Jews, now apply to the Gentile believers as well, except for things like the land of Israel, which is given specifically to the people. And I think one of the sad things in Christ- Christianity today is that many Christians walk around completely ignorant of what they what they've been given with what they've been given and the and what they're heirs of whilst they walk the earth never mind that you're heirs with christ and what you're going to inherit in the in the age to come but what you've got in the here and now most christians are completely oblivious to it and don't think it's about them i remember challenging someone about it once he said no no i just believe that that all those blessings are just for the jews i said yeah but it says here in galatians that this if you are a member with christ then you have access to the promises of abraham even as a gentile they still wouldn't believe it. It's just like, oh man, you know, it's there in black and white. And it's a shame. Um, so, the, yeah, I don't want to get into knots here. One of the questions, I'm just going to deal with this question in five minutes flat, okay? Because this comes up a lot. And as a church leader, I have to deal, address this particular issue a lot. Now again, I'm sorry, depending on what your background is here. But one of the problems that I, I see in today's average church, and, and there's a lot of nice people who are, oh, I'm always going to get myself in trouble with this. The problem I've come across is there, there's the Hebrew Roots Movement. Now, the Hebrew Roots Movement itself was designed to bring restoration to the Gentile church of the beauty and the majesty and the Jewishness of the scriptures and the traditions and the cultures, which we, for the most part, are completely naive to. And so it was to bring that back. And so in the late 70s, the Hebrew Roots Movement was a restoration movement of bringing back the things which the Gentile church has lost. But then it went way beyond that by then people saying, no, all Gentiles must now observe Torah. Um, And there are some, even some... uh, sects within the Hebrew Roots Movement saying that men must be circumcised. Okay, <clears throat> So in five minutes flat, I'm going to tell you how to rectify and resolve this tension, Okay, because this is their argument. In Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Jesus says, I've not come to do away with the Torah. But I haven't done away with it. And, it's going to be, and, and he said, no, I've come to fulfill it, the law and the prophets, but I haven't come to do away with it. And it will not... What, not one jot or tittle will pass away until the end of the age. And so it does have a best before date on it, but it will last only to the end of the age. Okay? It's not, it's, it can't be eternal. Why? Because when we go into the finally the new heaven and the new earth, it won't be relevant because there will be no sin. And the Torah is to, is to show and reveal the error of sin and what pleases God and what doesn't please God and the whole sacrificial system that goes with it. But we know in Revelation towards the end, the temple is finished with because it's the temple in heaven, because on the new heaven and new earth, there is no temple. It's the city, and God is now its temple. So all that temple worship that you see in Revelation from chapters 4, 5, 8, and so on and so forth, to right near the end, that's going on right now because there is sin in the world, and it's about God pouring out his bowls of wrath and all that kind of stuff upon the earth. Okay, So, sin, so, so the law itself is only relevant to the end of the age, which is when Messiah comes, he will rule for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, that's the shelf life of the Torah. So if the Torah is running right now, okay, how does that work with Christians who are in this other covenant, right? Well, Paul gets around this by stating this. In Romans 6, he says, look, this is how you die. When you get baptized, you are literally crucified with Christ in the waters of baptism. Down you go. When you come up out of the waters, you are a new creation in the likeness of the second Adam. He then goes on into Romans 7, and he teaches, look, verses 1 to 6, he says, look, it, 
if you if you're married and you want to be married to someone else, you can't get married to someone else unless that person dies, because otherwise you're guilty of committing adultery. Now, he's not using this to talk about remarriage and adultery. He's using this, he's talking about covenant. And he says, therefore, the Torah has power and authority over you and me as long as you are alive. So the get out of jail clause is, by dying with Christ in the waters of baptism and coming out to new birth in Christ, it now means you can be free to marry into a new covenant because you have died. And the Torah has no longer any power over you and to, it can't condemn you. And that's why he then says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's how the Torah is still running right now and the new covenant is running right now, and they're running like train tracks, side by side each other. And the only way you can get from under that, that, that rail to get onto this rail is through uh, belief in Christ and through baptism into and becoming the new creation. And that's it. But Christians get themselves in knots because they're like, well, no, the two covenants are the same covenant. You were grafted into Moses. There's not a single verse in the New Testament that says that. You're grafted into the Abrahamic covenant. Not one single verse about New Testament, uh, about uh, the Mosaic Covenant. And then, of course, Acts 15, should Gentiles observe Torah and should they get circumcised? The answer to that was an equivocally no and no. But they had to observe four things. Don't eat meat that's been strangled. Don't eat meat that's bit, got blood in it. Um, don't eat meat offered to idols and avoid fornication. If you do these things, you do well. And it also says in the letter that which they put that in, it said, seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just the apostles, hey, this is a great idea, guys. This will keep peace amongst the community. It seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. God. Okay, so God was okay with that. And that became the rule for the Gentiles. We know from the early church fathers, in the writings of the early church fathers, that that was a rule all the Gentile churches adhere to, whilst the Jewish believing churches, they carried on with their traditions of Torah, and no one had a problem with it, because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, if you remain as what you were when you were called, if you are uncircumcised, don't seek to be circumcised, and if you're circumcised, don't seek to be uncircumcised. In other words, if you're Jewish, stay Jewish. If you're Gentile, stay Gentile. Do not be a Gentile that converts to Judaism, and do not be a Jew that converts to Gentilism, or whatever that would be. Yeah, and that's it. That's the problem solved. Okay? In a nutshell. And uh, it took me 20 years to figure that out, praise God. I got there in the end. Whew. So you're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, so... So this is, this is all about covenant anyway. So understanding now that you're a child of Abraham and heirs of this covenant, we need to start piecing together some thoughts now, moving from that into things about healing. So I just want to confirm then. So you are justified by faith in Christ. Now justified is a legal term uh, as if... The, uh, it, as just as if I'd had never committed a wrong. Okay, that's what it means. It means that when the judge looks at you and it's got this weight of evidence against you because of what your faith in Christ has done, and it says in uh, Colossians 2, it says that Jesus put, when he was hung on the cross, all the written ordinances that were against us were above him. Those written ordinances are the charges against you and me why we should be crucified. And then Paul goes on to say that what Jesus did on the cross it annulled that thing, those, those things that were above him, and it also annulled the powers and principalities and their power over you. And at the moment, and in that moment you put your faith in Christ, you are crucified with Christ and you get put on the cross. And all of those charges and annulments against you are cancelled. And therefore Satan can't accuse you. Satan can't do things to you that you used to be able to anymore because he has been disarmed because you are dead. The Torah can't do anything to you anymore because you're dead. And the Torah only has authority over you as long as you're alive. But when you died with Christ, you see, when you came up out of the waters, you didn't just come up as another creature in the image of Adam. You came up as a new creature in the image of the second Adam. And you're completely, and it says in, I think it's Second Corinthians 3, uh, I think it's in that, that chapter of 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, but the Greek word there for new creation is a new species. In other words, a new class of being that didn't exist before. So in the Old Testament, there are only two types of people on the earth, Jews, Gentiles. Now there's three, Jews, Gentiles, and the church, which is the people of the new Adam. Isn't that exciting? 
Okay, so, you, so a lot of Christians don't know this stuff and they don't walk in the freedom and they want to get themselves into all kinds of bondage. Now, I don't care if you want to observe Jewish feasts and festivals and eat kosher, if that's what you want to do because you want to do it as to honouring the Lord. But then that then also gives me permission if I wanted to do like the Catholics do and eat fish on Fridays because that to me is my way of saying, Lord, this is how I want to honour you with my life. Can you see, can, you can see suddenly we're not looking at things in this religious spirit, but actually we're free to do all things, but also free to not do certain things as well. One, as Paul says, one man considers one day holy, another man considers all days holy. Each should be fully convinced in his own mind. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And so you can walk in freedom, doing whatever you want to do. As Paul says, don't let anyone judge you in respect to new moons and Sabbaths. But I love that verse because it means it works both ways. So if you're one that wants to do that, well, then no one's allowed to judge you for it. And if you don't want to do it, they can't judge you for not doing it. Each must be fully convinced in his own mind. If that's what you want to do to honour God, then you do it. If you want to, oh no, it's going to say it. If you want to celebrate Christmas, that pagan festival, but you do it as unto the Lord, then it is as unto the Lord. Now, I'm going to get even more hate mail now. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. What about Easter? Okay, If you want to celebrate Easter as unto the Lord, come on, bring that hate mail in. Um, then just, just do it as unto the Lord. Um, yeah. Any questions about any of that so far? By the way, Christmas doesn't have pagan roots. I know people will tell me it does, but I've done the research. It doesn't, nor does Easter. Easter used to be known as Pascha. Pascha is the Greek for Passover, and it became known as Easter because of some uh, place in uh, Europe where the name of the month which, East, which Pascha fell on was e- Easter or something, something like that, I can't the exact terminology, and that's where the word came from, and that just became, that's got no links to Ishtar at all, other than the fact that Easter and Easter sounds very similar, but they've got absolutely nothing in common with each other at all, etymologically, in any kind of way. And a lot of people will say, oh yes, but Chris, if you go back to the ancient Babylonian system, they worship this god on this day, and, and therefore if you do that, you're guilty of, of, uh, of Roman paganism and stuff. And it's like, well, if, if let's go back to the days of Nimrod in Babylon, which quite frankly no one really knows, because there's not much to talk about it, because there's no, hardly any historical records about it. But let's say Nimrod ate breakfast every single day, and he was a pagan. Does that mean I can't eat breakfast now? Because if I eat breakfast under the system of, of uh, Nimrod that I'm now a pagan, you can't, you can't use that logic. It's just silly. You, know, you are free in Christ. Not all things are permissible, but there's a lot of things that you are allowed and free to do as long as you do it as unto the Lord. Amen? We get ourselves all tied up in knots. Now, you might think I'm going off on a tangent here, but actually I'm not. This is all essential to you as a believer so that you won't get people tying you up in knots by saying, I think you must do this and you shouldn't do that. Actually, when you understand your covenantal relationship with God, you understand that you're not in the Torah, but you're in this new covenant, you're free to do what you want. If that's, I want to observe things on that second rail, you go do it. But you know that the power of your life comes from the first rail, yeah? See what I'm saying? Just, just enjoy your life. Don't make it so harsh. Make it, make it so hard. Um, okay. What are we up to now? Okay, so one of the keys of... Uh, I've got loads of scriptures here, but I haven't got time to look at them. So one of the keys to making all of this work in respect to covenant love, uh, covenant relationship, sorry, is love. Now, in the Bible, when it talks about love, it's the, it's the Greek word agape, Okay, it's not, there's, there's different types of love. There's filio love, which is like brotherly, sisterly love. Hello, brother. Hello, sister. Okay, then there's eros love, uh, which is where we get erotic love from. But you need to understand that eros love is not just in the realm of sex. It's also passionate love for God. Okay, you can be very, er- uh, in your love, you're, you're passionate about your God. Okay, so it's not uncommon to see the word eros used in respect to a passionate love for God. All right, now that's something you might feel uncomfortable about, but it's in the Greek, it's there. You know, no one has a problem with it. Church, church fathers never had a problem with it. You know, it's, it's because all of these things God has given to us. And so when we love Jesus, we love him like a brother. When we love him, we love him passionately. Uh, and, uh, and then the other love, which is agape, which is we love him unconditionally. Even when sometimes when suffering comes our way and we don't understand why a, a loving God would allow suffering to come our way, we still choose to love him unconditionally like he chose to love us unconditionally. Are you with me? So it's that agape, is that giving unconditional love. Hallelujah. Um, you know, famous scriptures like Galatians 5, 6, faith worketh through Love. Everything works through love. For all of the stuff that you want to work in your life, uh, to be covenant-minded, it all flows from love. Amen. Everything flows through love. Um, full of God's word. 
practicing God's word, being a people of prayer, flooded with the presence of the holy triunity, the Trinity, and know who you are in Christ. If you as a leader can walk in those kind of things, you're going to have such a great life in Jesus. Yeah? I mean, you might get a lot of hassle thrown your way, but who cares? You're doing it God's way. You're being faithful to what he's entrusted you to. I'll just say it again. So for all this stuff to work, we need to be covenant-minded, walking in love, full of God's word, practicing God's word, being a people of prayer, flooded with the presence of the holy triunity, and knowing who you are in Christ. That's the power that you have as a leader. If you're confident in those things, man, nothing can shake you. Nothing. People can say things about you, and it's like, oh, well, whatever. But nothing can shake you when you have that kind of rock-solid faith in Christ. And so I want to talk a little bit now, moving from that into what you can do practically in things like ministry, um, is how to operate in faith and how to um, sort of be able to pray for people and praying for the sick. One of the things that I think is difficult with some Christians when it comes to praying for the sick, and I used to have this a long time ago when I was younger, and I remember some girl in our youth group, she's like, I've got a really sore foot, can, can someone pray for healing on it, please? And the question that as I reached out in boldness of faith to touch that foot was, is it God's will, will to heal her foot? Now, I look back on myself now and would give myself a slap. Of course it's his will to heal her foot. But back then... These were questions that I'd asked. And it says in James, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if you think, yeah, I believe that God wants to heal you, but there's another thing in the back here going, yeah, but is it God's will? Yeah, but is it God's will? Yeah, then nothing's going to work for you. It's just not going to happen. So you have to get your mind in unity. Yeah? So that means you've got to get your theology right, and that means you need to get your practice right. Author praxis, which is right practice, and author... I can't remember... No, not orthodontist. I knew, I knew that was coming. Orthodontist. Uh, there's orthopraxy and there's uh, orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is cr- uh, correct doctrine and orthopraxis is correct practice. And so if you've got those two things working right, then you won't be double-minded. And when you go to do things in ministry, it will work effectively. Now, this brings me back to my first point. If you are shouting out from the pulpit, you know, you're saved in Jesus' name, you can just you know, just know his salvation, you can walk in peace and you're inside in here. You're like, I'm not in a place of peace. I doubt my own salvation some days. I'm really struggling right now. Yeah, um, Because you've got your theology out of whack. Something's wrong inside here. You're double-minded in all you do. Yeah, You can't be that person. I mean, how, how many people have, have uh, been guilty of that? Saying one thing coming out of their mouth, but inside you're like, no, nah, I'm not living the reality of that. Okay, So this is important. So these are, this is why we need to spend the time getting these things right. And it comes through getting the word in us. It comes through getting certain things right. So when it comes to praying for the sick, you have to settle these issues. And how do we settle these issues? We settle them by the authority of the word. Um, so let's just look up a few scriptures here. So um, 1 John 3, 8. So uh, it says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So one of the key things is that, okay, now this is a bit difficult. Does all sickness come from the devil? Does some sickness come from the Lord? <laughs> some people are like, some Christians get themselves really... Uh, but you need to understand that, and also... People that sin can make themselves sick by their sins. I mean, it's interesting, Jesus' disciples, remember the guy that was born blind and, uh, and, and uh, Jesus healed him? And, and, but the first question his disciples asked Jesus was, well, did this man sin or did his parents sin? Now, if that was a goofy question to ask, Jesus would have rebuked them, but he didn't. He said, no, this, is, this one's actually for the glory of God. In other words, he must have been teaching them something that sin has a key component to play when dealing with illness. I know that when we've done ministry... Uh, at church, we, we've seen some dramatic results when people have confessed their sins. I'll give you one example. This was what me and Claire did. We went to this lady. She's not even a believer. And she wanted some prayer ministry, and she had some, some serious things wrong with her, her legs like this. Was it like a flesh-eating thing? It was, it was just, she was in a wheelchair, practically. And uh, we went round there, and I was going through this diagnostic thing. We were just asking her all these questions. And then she just said one thing. She said, and of course, my, what my sister did that day was unforgivable. And I was like, do you know when that was? He said, yeah, it was on this date. And I said, and when did you get ill? One week later. And I said, well, that's it. I said, you need to forgive your sister uh, for what she did. And I didn't think she would do it, being an unbeliever. But she did, didn't she? 
and within six weeks her legs were practically back to normal. We go round down round there, did another session, and she's completely healed. An unbeliever, completely healed, just because she confessed her sins and that allowed the grace of God to come in and heal. So yeah, so us sinning can make us sick. The devil can make us sick. And there have been situations in scripture where Jesus or, or where script like in Revelation, if you do not repent of your sins, I'll put you on a sick bed. You know, and it's like, well, did Jesus do it, or was it because he allowed the sin? It doesn't matter, whatever, if, whether he permitted it or whether he allowed it. It's the same results is that sickness has come about because God has allowed it. Okay, so I don't want to get into all of that. But devil is generally the author of sin and sickness and disease and all that sort of stuff. God isn't. Um, sin brings sickness. And sometimes in scriptures, God does do things to make, make people pay attention or wake up. There's things in the Old Testament. Uh, there's a, that, what, that Charles. I don't want to go into details because I'll get more hate mail. But anyway, but understand that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Now you have the kingdom of God residing within you. You have the Holy Spirit within you. So therefore, do you think God wants to use you as his body to still keep on destroying the works of the devil? Yeah? That shouldn't even be a question. It should be like, uh, maybe. That shouldn't be, that shouldn't be. It's like absolutely, completely, and authoritatively, I can say yes without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus wants to destroy the works of darkness through his body. Amen? Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if we're the body on the earth, and he's the same, then the mission's still the same. Okay? Nothing's changed. Oh, oh this is a good one. Acts 10.38. Oh, I love this one. I love it. This one set up a, someone got a revelation of this back in the day and it set off a whole healing uh, revival in America. It was amazing. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He and all that were oppressed of the devil. Amen? Now, some things that Jesus hates, four things that uh, uh, Jesus hates. Uh, Tracy had this in a vision once. She, she had this dream where Jesus spoke to her and said there was these things that I, he hates. Satan, sin, sorrow, sickness. He hates Satan, he hates sin, he hates sorrow, and he hates sickness. Okay? These things were dealt with in the atonement. Okay? Now when Jesus heals... Everything he did was through the atonement. You go, what? but Jesus healed before the atonement. That's because he's the lamb that was sacrificed before the foundation of the earth. You're thinking one-dimensionally. You're thinking like an earthling where you have a start point and an end point. The cross is timeless. So every, you know, in the Old Testament, when they had all their sins uh, forgiven, even though they sacrificed an animal, it was actually being put on the credit card, so to speak, in the future when the cross would, would pay, the pr pay the price. So God still forgave them for their sins in the Old Testament because it was being dealt with by the cross. Just like we are now in the future from that point, and we can still get our sins atoned for by something that happened 2,000 years in the past. Okay? It's a timeless thing that affects all the ages, including healing as well. Um, let's turn to um, Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. Fifty three and verse four to six. Uh, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. This is talking about all these aspects that have been dealt with in the atonement. Okay? So this means psychological sickness is dealt with in the atonement. So all the, all the, everything to do with the soul is dealt with in the atonement. Things to do with the flesh are dealt with in the atonement. Now some people get a bit antsy about that. Well, God doesn't heal everybody. Yeah, but God doesn't save everybody either. But as an evangelist, you wouldn't say, I'm not preaching anymore. I'm giving up preaching now because I preached today and only two people got healed, uh, saved. You know, and I, I, I shouted to thousands of them and only two people got saved. I'm not doing this anymore. That's, that's, that's illogical. You as a Christian have got to pray for the sick. And uh, it says in Mark 16, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's a part of the atonement. Now some people say healing isn't a part of the atonement. Well I say it is. Why? Because the ultimate healing is the resurrection of your body from the ground. And if you're saying that's not in the atonement, then you've got some serious theological um, answers that you need to come up with. Because your resurrection from the dead can only come through the power of the cross and Christ's resurrection. So it is in the atonement. Okay? 
So your physical body and God's care of it is through the atonement, including the resurrection and what goes on in it here in the now. Um, one more scripture, and I could give you loads, but they're just. But these are like, why am I giving you these? Because you need to not be double-minded, and you need to know. Well, God's word says it; that settles it. Yeah, there's, there's nothing to argue about. The case has been made, and then you just need to believe it. That's the hard bit. Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I'll praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. Okay? Again, it's talking about the healing of God. Okay? So that's Psalm 103, verses 1 to 4. You know, and there's others, like, by his stripes I am healed, etc., etc. Um... And remember those scriptures that we read in Galatians where Jesus Christ has, has took upon himself the curse of the law. In other words, he became sickness. Okay, the Deuteronomic curses are all about sickness and terrible things. He took upon himself every sickness. And the Torah also says, even sicknesses and illnesses that are not written in this Torah shall come upon you. Okay, so Jesus, he took upon himself AIDS and every kind of virus and every kind of disease that's possible. He literally became the embodiment of sin and sickness and death so that you and I can walk free and be atoned both in the air of our soul, in the air of our spirit, and in the air of our flesh. Amen? It's a tripartite God who went to the cross and gave us a tripartite salvation. All right? Because that's not what's taught anymore. We're, we just say, well, Jesus just died for your spirit, man. You know, and as for your soul, well, good luck. Just get some counseling. You know, Jesus came and dealt with all of those three issues. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Isn't he amazing? So when you know some of this stuff, when you go to lay hands on the sick and stuff, have some boldness, have some confidence that actually what I'm doing is, is part of God's work here. I'm, I'm destroying the deeds of darkness. We're dealing with the issues of sin. Now we know that the issue of sin is there because um, in James when it talks about if any amongst you sick, call for the elders. They'll come round. It says that you will be anointed with oil. It says your sins shall be forgiven and then you shall be raised up. So again, there's a clear, well, it was obviously sickness and sin, there's always like some connection going on, so the sins will be forgiven, and then they will be healed. Amen? All right, okay, so praying for the sick and the demonized, an idiot's guide. Okay, any idiots in the room tonight? Okay, right, good, we're in good company. So firstly, um, I mean, this is, uh, this is all suck egg stuff. When I do the proper prayer ministry teaching, I'll, I'll go into an awful lot of detail on this. But the first thing to do is pray for the obvious, you know, uh, maybe I'm wrong in, <laughs> I'm wrong in doing this, but you know, like, oh, oh, I'm dragging their leg up to the front. <clears throat> Can I have some prayer, please? You know, what do you want to pray for? It's like, oh, my ear? It's like, my leg? Why, what do you think's wrong with me? You know, sometimes things are obvious, maybe sometimes they're not, but praying for the obvious. So if someone is suffering from depression, for example, an obvious and simple prayer is to deal with depression and prayer. Now, listen. This does work, okay? I, I suffered with demonic depression when I first got saved. I went forward, I had a, a bunch of guys at an FGBMFI meeting, they prayed over me, 15 minutes, I was immediately and completely healed, okay? There are other times where we pray for people with depression and it doesn't go, and so therefore we have to do some quite deep ministry with them, it takes a couple of weeks, and then they get delivered of their depression. Okay, so sometimes the quick lay hands on them doesn't always do the job. Sometimes there's a process that some people need to go through because actually praying for the depression is not the root cause. It's just a symptom of an underlying issue that that's what needs to be dealt with. Are you all with me? So sometimes my depression wasn't an underlying issue because my depression was demonically, came upon me demonically. And I know that it was because I could be instantly fine one minute and I'd feel this blackness just come upon me and I'd instantly be depressed and take my life. That can only be demonic. So that getting cast off me was, was the key to my healing. But for other people, sometimes it's a process that they have to go through. Uh, and I'll teach you how to do that when I run that course. Um, so praying for the obvious, just doing it, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you, uh, even when praying for the obvious. And this is another thing. You must learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. I don't even listen to what the people say to me, because more often what they're saying to me is what they would like to be healed, but isn't actually what needs to be healed. Well, you know, I just, you know, this all happened because blah, 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 blah. I actually tell, I know it sounds real, I actually tell, I've done this long enough now to know that I don't actually really need to listen to them because they can tell me what the symptom is, 
but they often themselves don't know what the root cause is. So I'll listen to the Holy Spirit instead. I'll just say, okay, you've got depression. Let's, let's just pray about that. And I'll listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying. Now, because of lots of practice, and again, in the prayer training ministry thing, I teach people actually how to listen to the Spirit, how to lay hands on someone, and you can actually hear the Holy Spirit showing you things in that individual because you've touched them and information's coming through. And it all sounds really weird, but this is, this is just charismatic ministry, right? There's nothing weird about it. Uh, you can touch someone, you can know things, as the Holy Spirit is allowing you to know things about that individual. Okay, this is not unusual. It's, you know, people say, oh yeah, but that was Jesus. Well, Jesus was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, fully God, but fully man. And he limited himself to the conditions of a man when he walked the earth. So he showed us what it's like to be a Holy Spirit filled man and doing ministry in the limitations of a human body with the limitations of a human mind, but with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said... There have been times where I literally know what people are thinking. There are times when I can lay hands on someone and I immediately know what's going on inside them. I know that they've been through trauma and I know all these things that are coming through. It's not because I'm so good. It's because the Holy Spirit is revealing these things and I'm taking the time to listen to what God is saying and not what the person is telling me. Because most people don't know themselves that well. They say these things, but actually they're just saying what their symptoms are, but they're not actually telling you the real underlying issue. Uh, and sometimes that takes a bit, of a bit of effort to get through that. If, for example, you're praying for the obvious, and it's quite clear that, that nothing's happening here, then that's when I then generally say to them, hey, we can do some much deeper prayer ministry for you if you want. We can just go through some stuff with you. Um, and that's really the way I prefer to do it, because I really want my heart is to see people set free. And when those people are set free, they're great. You know, uh, We have one lady here, and she's been through some terrible stuff. And, uh, you know, just, just things that I wouldn't even want to mention. It's just so awful. And um, we've had three sessions. I've got another one coming up, I think, next week. And she, she's just like a, she's just a place of joy. She's been carrying this weight of heaviness around her for so long, and then she just, just, it's gone now. It's just gone, you know. But that took some working through some stuff, you know, and listening to the Holy Spirit and just asking the right questions as well. And that's another thing. Ask the right questions to get the right answer. Sometimes you, you'd say, hey, what's wrong? It's not always the right question to ask. Praying for more insight, it's really important, again, that you're listening for the Spirit, saying, the Holy Spirit, what is going on here? Don't, um, how many people here are fixers? Put your hands up, Trace, you're a fixer. Okay, all right. Let me, let me just say to you now, as fixers, you need to be aware of something. What you will want to do is fix people in prayer ministry, okay? Now let me tell you what fixing does to people. You're driving a car, uh, I use this as a great illustration, but there's something wrong with the tracking on the steering, it always veers to the left. So a fixer would say this, well what you need to do, love, is if you just pull a bit harder to the right, then your car will go straight, everything's fine, you just need to remember just to pull it a bit harder to the, yeah, but, but that's, that's still not fixing the issue, it's just, it's just, it's behavior management. Our job is not to behave on that, behavior manage people. Our job is not to fix people. Our job is not to counsel people. It is the Holy Spirit is the counselor, and it's the Holy Spirit who is the healer. It is one of the most important things you must remember about prayer ministry. Your job is not to fix people. Your job is not to be a Messiah figure to people. Your job is to allow the Spirit to do what he needs to do. Your job is not to get in the way, but just to assist the moving of the Spirit and what he wants to do. So if you are a fixer, Beware trying to say, well, maybe if you did this, or maybe if you did that. It's like, there is a time and a place where you can give some ideas, you know, like if they're struggling with something. But if you're trying to behave your manage them, that's not what they need. We're not fixers. We're not healers. God is. And another thing is, if you go down that road, people come reliant on you. You know, I know, I literally know some people that have spent like 16 years with the same person. Oh, I've got the same problems. Like, because that person has made themselves like a Messiah type figure where they just keep going back for ministry off this individual because they're the only ones that can do it. Because actually what that person's done, knowingly or unknowingly, has, made a, has put a dependency uh, thing into their ministry and has made them dependent on them. And here's another thing. Some people need to be dependents. They, they want to be affirmed. So they, they like this kind of Messiah complex so that they can get affirmed by people. It's demonic and it's wrong and that means they, they need healing and they need sorting out. Amen? Have we all seen this? Yeah, we've all seen it in, in various different guises. Um, yeah. And so, because the thing is with, with prayer ministry, you can give people tools that they can go away and heal themselves. Actually, once they know some certain principles, they can go away and deal with a lot of stuff themselves. Uh, which is good. Um, what else? Uh, so when praying for people who are sick in a longer session, I'll get the prayer to sit down and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal things that need to be confessed and dealt with. Um, 
you know, quite often, I tell you, it's amazing, quite often we, we in, in these sessions, we just let the Holy Spirit speak, and then suddenly they'll remember something they've never remembered in their whole life, which is some child trauma or something, just bang, came in. oh my gosh, I just remembered this, and they confess it, and we go through it, and they get set free, and they get healed, yeah, the Holy, only the Holy Spirit can do that, you can't do that, I can't do that, yeah, um, also praying to be available, Ask God for assistance in improving your time management and the reordering of your life's priorities so you can be available for the ministry opportunities. Because scripture is clear that we are the body of Christ and each of us has different functions and varying gifts. However, one is, when one is sick, we all suffer, as the scriptures say. So it's good for us all to come to a place of freedom. Amen? Okay. Um, the next one is about taking authority. Um, we're authorized and deputized to use the powerful name of Jesus to set people free from sickness and demons. How many people have actually um, been involved in deliverance ministry? Okay, so yeah, probably about a third of the room there, I think. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. On, the On the receiving end, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, me too, brother, me too. It's, uh, it's fun stuff. But you see, this is, this is quite funny because... Um, I, when it comes to dealing with, uh, with the demonic, I tend to do things a bit differently. It doesn't always work as planned, but generally it does. Um, is that I, I generally don't like the whole, um, the big demon show, you know, where the head's doing a 360 and there's vomit everywhere and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Because it's, you know, it might be exciting for the Christian, but actually it's very tiring, it's very exhausting. And actually it's very... Um, uh, for the person that's doing it, they feel really embarrassed by what they've done, and it's 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 just not good for them either. So we do I do something something slightly different. Now you might go, well, Jesus didn't do that, but it, it, let me explain something about what Jesus did. He did what we call confrontational ministry. Now, if you're in a, and this generally happens in evangelistic crusades. If you're pushing and advancing the gospel into an area, you will get a manifestation of the demonic. It just happens. Okay, people start screaming, Woo! you know, and so in that instant, you have to deal with it because the demon is manifested now okay we're not in a controlled environment where we can talk about it and do this and do that so it has to be dealt with right there and then that's called a kingdom confrontation the powers of darkness have manifested you have to instantly manifest the power of god back to deal with it so that's what jesus did that's why he'd like walk into a village and someone would start manifesting and he dealt with it okay uh, i appreciate there are other examples as well but in respect to demons, I make it a part of deliverance ministry to take authority of the demon to actually not manifest. Um, so I, I've done this. I told you about the guy in the ambulance in a few weeks back here. Yeah. So there's other, other instances where um, it doesn't always work because sometimes people take you by surprise and they immediately start manifesting and it's like, okay, we just have to deal with it now. But generally what I would do is I'll say to the person, I mean, I had a woman once, she was upstairs and... Um, she, she got completely delivered. There was no screaming, no shouting, no rolling around the floor, none of that. And it was all very quiet and very gentle. And so what I do is I speak to the demon, once we've uh, uh, managed to find out there's one in there. Sometimes it's not always that clear. And I'll say to them, right, I address that particular demon. I say, I don't give you, I said, you, can ha you have authority to speak into the thoughts of that individual. That individual will then relay through their own mouth those thoughts, but you are not permitted to manifest. You're not permitted to use their mouth. You're not permitted to do anything other than what I've just told you. And then suddenly the people will ask, ask a question. Sometimes they don't get anything. I'll ask a question again. Sometimes they'll say something that's relevant to, you know, like there was one particular instance where I asked the person the question, uh, and I said, what de where ha demon, when did you come into this person's life? Uh, and they said, and it was at a time of a car crash, and it was like a time of intense trauma, that's when it came. So, dealt with that trauma, because we'd done some healing ministry, then all we just dealt with was the authority issue, bang, out, gone. No, no, no crying, no bawling, no rolling around the floor, no fireworks, no drama, just out, gone, okay? Um, so there's, that's one of the ways. Unfortunately, sometimes you're doing inner healing ministry, and then so suddenly, you know, we had one person, <laughs> bless her, and uh, everything was fine, and then so I, just, I, don't, I don't think I feel very well. I don't, I just think, Rah! and then, uh, you know, and then you have to die and just have to deal with it. And uh, there's other times where it just took us completely by surprise. Or there was one, there was one particular time where, no, I won't say it because you don't know who it is, but... The, yeah, I've done deliverance ministry over the phone as well. I remember this one woman, she'd uh, got herself into a real bad way and she was manifesting on the phone. She said, you've got to help me, you've got to come down here now. And I said, 
I said, it's three o'clock at night, I'm not coming down now, I've got to go to bed. I said, you can help me, you won't help me. I said, I'll just bind it over the phone. That doesn't work. I said, well, it will. And I just said, in the name of Jesus, I bind you now, uh, and you will give this woman no more trouble until I get there till tomorrow. And she went, ah! oh, it's worked. I said, yes, of course it works. That's it. It's the name of Jesus. They have to do as they're told. So that was it. Put the phone down, went in the next day, and uh, managed to deal with some of her issues, bless her. And, um, yeah. So... Um, listening to the spirit again is really important with all this kind of stuff. Another thing about dealing with demons is you don't, sometimes I will, depending on the nature of it, but generally you don't have to shout all the time. You can just talk to them in the name of Jesus. Um, but the thing is with demons, and I have to be honest here, some of them are right sticky little individuals. Some of them don't like to come out at all. And, uh, and even if you've done loads of inner healing and you've dealt with all like the, what I'd call the strongholds that tie them into that person, even after you've dealt with that, some of them still just don't want to come out. So that's hard, you know. And it's like Jesus said, this one can only come out by prayer and fasting. So there's a place where you do have to pray a lot and you do have to be fast and stuff to give you that spiritual authority um, to be able to get that thing out. Um, whatever. Yeah, listening to the Spirit to get the recipient to confess undisclosed sins, that's a biggie. Um, people's, people's hidden sins, people's um, secret sins, you know, uh, this is really important to, you, you, you've got to deal with that, um, especially in our own lives as well. Oh, here's a funny one, pray with your eyes open. I don't always do this, I must admit, but a friend of mine, or a pastor that I know, he was one night, he was like, this lady came up to him, and she said, oh, can you pray for me, please, pastor? He's like, okay. So he's had his hands hovering over his head, and his eyes touched, she went, oh, Jesus, Lord, blah, blah, blah. it was going on for ages. And when he opened his eyes, she wasn't even there. She'd walked off ages ago, and he's been sat there in the corner, stood there in the corner, and going, oh, Jesus, like a crazy guy. Uh, yeah. So it's good to keep your eyes open. Um, if you know your authority in Christ, you don't need to shout at people. Um, I've been in situations where, um, where it's just turned into absolute mayhem. Now, there has been times where I said to people in a, in a, in a difficult situation, get firm, speak loudly, speak clearly, let's pray in tongues, let's worship the Lord, making it an uncomfortable environment for a demon to stick around in there, okay? But generally, I, I, don't, I don't really like to shout at demons because there's, there's no need to. You've got the authority. Um, if there are mixed sex sessions, you know, when you do ministry, I, a man with a woman, then make sure there's another woman available. It's not healthy for a man to pray with a woman alone and vice versa. Generally, men with men and women with women. So if I've got to do any ministry with women, I'll generally have another woman in the room with me as well who knows what she's doing um, because that's helpful. It's good for her, but it's good for me because any allegation can be said these days, you know, and that, that's it. You're, 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 it used to be innocent until proven guilty. Now it's guilty until proven innocent, and then it's too late anyway. Yeah, the damage is done. Um, order in the house of God. We're called to pray for Christians and non-believers alike. However, when it comes to believers, I think they're, they're, it's important that there are house rules. I, I tell you, I've seen some right shenanigans in prayer ministry. We had this one guy, but because he was trained by by some great healer, he he he, even though you know. I'm like a pastor and stuff, and he was like on the prayer team. He just, one day, I was just praying for something, and he literally pushed me out of the way so that he could lay hands on this person and show them how, show us all how it was done. Okay, didn't get any results, and no wonder, because he just did not, he just didn't, he just had no respect for what's going on in the room. You wouldn't do that to Jesus, would you? Not that I'm saying I'm Jesus, but you wouldn't do it to anybody. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go up to your manager and, oh, get off, I'll, I'll, you know, I know what I'm doing. You know, so, dude, you're, you're in, for a, uh, in for a severe rebuke or lose your job. You, know, you just don't do that. But in church, we do, right? Anything, uh, I, I know best because I'm this and I'm that. You know, the arrogancy and the, and, the, and the things that people get up to. But anyway, so there has to be order in the house of God. There needs to be uh, recognized and dedicated prayer teams in the church with a team leader that have been sanctioned by senior leadership, not sanctioned by, well, I think it's me because I've had more training and I know more about this than everybody else, therefore I should be boss. Yeah, we've all seen that. You know, guilty of that? Room's gone quiet, okay. So, um, you cannot have people who are not mature or right themselves with God to pray for others as well. That's another thing. If you've got someone who's a complete wreck, you, you can't have them on prayer ministry. I'm sorry. And that's not to say that you have to be a perfect saint because we're all working through stuff. But if you're dealing with habitual sin, you've got secret sin, you've got some major issues of character, yeah, even though I've seen such people do genuine healings and miracles, okay, but that, remember that I said a few weeks ago about 
anointing versus character. Okay? They'll be held accountable for things that they're doing wrong with their, with their character. And so at the end of the day, it's important that as Christians we learn to respect one another. Um, you know, we had an issue with one of our church plants where uh, the, the leadership just let anybody pray for anybody. We had complete strangers coming in, okay, uh, and this one of these complete strangers tried to cast out a demon out of someone, and we as a network nearly got sued for it. And it's like, and so did, then we sat down and was like, how can we solve this problem? I don't know who came up with the idea, but it was like, it was genius. It's like, let's have a prayer ministry team. Of course, what a clever idea. That means we control the room again in the sense of we don't get complete strangers coming in doing what they want to do and because that's their ministry, but actually we can control it a bit better. We don't get sued and we can get well trained at what we do and then everybody is happy and the church feel happy. Women are not going, I feel really uncomfortable with this strange man put hands on me, etc., etc. Okay? So I know some of the hyper charismatics like, well, you know, it's body ministry, man, we just do what we want. You know, as a leader, sometimes I allow, you know, in the meeting, I say, hey, just let hands on the person next to you and we'll pray for one another, yeah? But when it comes to complete strangers casting demons out of another Christian and stuff like that, it's just in a church meeting, it's, it's, it's dangerous, yeah? I know I'm going to get myself into trouble for saying that, but all I'm trying to say is there has to be a sense of order in the house. There just has to be, because it's like, oh, so-and-so did this. Who's, who's, who's the head of this team? Because I want to speak to them. I'm not happy about this. Oh, there is no head of a team. This is just random strangers that have come in off the streets that are just praying for people because they feel that's their ministry. People would not come back to that church again because it's like, I don't feel safe in that place if that's, if that's how they do things. Okay? Uh, and hyper-charismatics wouldn't have a problem with it, but we come across a lot of people that would easily leave a church like that because not everyone's in that hyper-charismatic place where they don't care. Some people are genuinely like, I don't want strangers laying hands on me. I want people that I can trust, you know, that I know what they're doing. Because this is a church. This is not like an evangelistic crusade where you can get away with that kind of stuff. And sometimes it's, you have to do it because there's no other way of doing it. But in a church context, we can be more mature about it. And we can do it better. We can do it more sensibly. Amen. So that's why we've got a, a prayer ministry team and they work hard. So uh, Keith and Claire, they, run, they head up that prayer ministry team. Um, so I've trained those guys and then I, I help them to do any really difficult stuff and then, but most of the time they go out by themselves and they're hopefully starting to train up some more people as well soon which would be great alright so that's, that's enough to that next week will be the last theory session which will be like um, how to deal with conflict Okay, so that the place should be packed for that one. So, like, oh yeah, I've got some people I want to deal with. Okay, so how to deal with conflict in leadership and ministry and dealing with confrontation and all that kind of stuff and how to diffuse nasty explosions and things and how to, how to win the unwinnable scenario and what you do in that as well. Okay, so any questions for, for tonight? Yeah, I'm just speaking to the mic. Okay, um, on the line of ministering, um, you say casting out demons. Um, are we putting ourselves at risk? Could we be putting ourselves at risk even though we're a Christian and we believe because these things are uncertain and they're very clever as well? So how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Can you put yourself at risk if you're dealing with a demonic? You can if you're stupid, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I, I had a situation once where we had this, it was, it was our old, plant in Cattersfield and it was completely, no one was there, I was, I was there in the morning setting up all by myself and this guy came in and uh, I mean, he was a right mess and he was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm hearing voices, I've got all this stuff coming at me and things and and, uh, he, and I said, oh, I'll just pray for you. And the Bible says, lay not hands hastily and stuff. And I just didn't think, I didn't ask the Spirit of God, didn't do anything. I just put my hand on him. And as I put my hand on him and started praying, I shut my eyes and this cold ice just ran all up my arm and into my head. And when I opened my eyes, this guy was like, looking at me like that. And inside I was going, mommy, <laughs> sucking my thumb. And, uh, and I just immediately felt the Holy Spirit saying, you shouldn't have done that by yourself. You should have, been, you should have had someone else with you do things like that in pairs. It's, it's complete strangers coming. You could have done anything. You would, you just, yeah. So, it's, it's, so yeah, you can put yourself at risk if you're not in a good place uh, or if you've just done things without thinking about it. So the rest of that day, I could barely preach. I was just like, because my brain had fog that came through that man. I just, you know, and it's, although it went by the end of the day, I had to pray it off me and all that kind of stuff. And so there is that. But generally, 
uh, in that situation, if there's a few, a couple of you there, you know, and you know your authority, Luke 10, 19, you know, I give you a power and authority to tread upon snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, nothing by any means shall harm you. That is the authority of the believer. But like you say, you, you've got to do things right, because if you do things stupid, you can open yourself up to a bit of trouble. But generally, as a Christian, even if you do get a little critter that wants to come home with you, uh, a bit of prayer and stuff, you get rid of it. Yeah, but yeah. But if you're an individual that's really like, I don't know. Let's just just put it bluntly. It's like you're you're like some of the Christians addicted to porn or something, and you're out there doing deliverance ministry. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't do that if I were you, because you just you've got a massive area there of unconfessed sin. Nobody knows about it. You're living in darkness. You you're under the kingdom of darkness by doing what you're doing. You're under guilt and shame. You should not be in a place where you're laying hands on the sick and trying to cast out demons, because you're just going to walk yourself into a world of trouble. Yeah. Again, let's not say we have to be super saints, but it's just common sense. Do you know what I mean? It's just common sense. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Good question. Hello? Anybody? Well, give us, give us one. Just for the people at home, because they'll be like... Um, so you've done... Covenant theology first, and then you've done healing and deliverance ministry. So, are you saying is, is your main message there that if we're not absolutely certain of our identity through covenant, then we're not really going to have much success at or authority through knowing our identity in healing and deliverance ministry? It was just one thought. Um, have you linked them together? Because they're two and one. Um, the passage in Matthew you said about this type when he comes out with um, by prayer and fasting is that passage not about unbelief? So unbelief only comes out through prayer and fasting, or is it about the demon? I mean, I've heard all sorts of teaching on it. So, what were your thoughts on that? And there's a few more, but I'll come to you. So, so the issue of unbelief, I've heard it from a, a faith preacher who, who used it from that angle of dealing with unbelief. But actually, when I looked at his theology behind it, you had to do some serious gymnastics to make, well, if you go back to this verse in like six chapters previously, blah, 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 it's like, then it's not quite clear. The context is this kind will only go out by prayer and fasting. Um, because... Unbelief is really a lack of faith. It's not something that you cast out, although it is an attitude. Faith itself is um, uh, is difficult to convey. It, it is it's a part of who God is because the scriptures say, say when the scriptures say have faith in God, that's not what it says. It says have the faith of God. Um, so the faith comes from Him. We know from Ephesians two eight, it says uh, we're justified, we're saved by faith through grace or grace through faith. Um, but that not, but that's a gift of God. It's not, it's not of you. Um, so basically, even the gift to believe in God in the first place is a gift of faith, and it's not your faith that comes from God, but He gives to you, so you can even believe in Him in the first place. So unbelief. I don't think is a well. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I personally, I don't think that's what the context is. The this that type only comes out by uh, prayer and fasting. I do think so. The demon, but there are. But there are. Then it would say. Uh, but in some commentators, it would say best. But that verse was added in 500 A.D. And it's like, mm, well, we don't really know that for absolute sure. But let's say if it wasn't even added at 500 A.D., you have to ask why did they even add it. Um, and I know of many like uh, people like oh I can't remember his name it's off the top of my head a uh, real famous healing evangelist a uh, very well respected man um, not controversial at all and he had to go to the Philippines once and there was this woman that was in prison and literally these tears would appear on her flesh as some demon was literally like dragging its claws down her and stuff and he, he prayed and he was asked to go and deliver it no one could deal with that at all and he was asked to go there and he just felt the spirit saying this will only come out by prayer and fasting so he prayed and he fasted and when he went in there he had the authority to deal with it and because she got delivered literally tens of thousands of people um, came to Christ because of it okay so when you, hit, when you come across stories like that, and there's loads of others, you just think, actually, uh, praying and fasting is really important. And, uh, we, and there are some traditions that try to downplay the importance of fasting, like, oh, well, fasting is really work of the flesh. No, it's not. 
fasting is a sacrifice. It's you humbling yourself, and God honors that. I don't know why, but it works, and he likes it when Christians fast. It adds, adds weight. It's a form of sacrifice. It's adding extra, extra salt to the, to the offering, as it so to speak, so when it goes up, it's more acceptable to be before God, and it has greater power to it, and it shows that you're taking it seriously, you know, and, and it's true, it works. You know, I remember when, we, when I used to go, uh, to, go to Malaysia and do ministry work, they made us do, they told us you can't go until you fasted for seven days before you even went. And we saw some amazing things that God did out there because we prepared ourselves and we did the praying and we did the fasting and stuff. So I do think it's important. Uh, the first question, why did I link covenant to healing, is because if, if, you, if you yourself are not necessarily got it all together. I'm not saying that you won't see healings and miracles, not at all. What I'm trying to say is, first part, is you as the individual, you need to really know your salvation in Christ, so you're good as a leader, because if that, if you're not right with that, then it's going to come out of you and your congregation or the people around you, home groups or whatever, they're going to pick up on it, and it will infect them. But I'm trying to also link it to healing because cov- understanding covenant is essential to understanding the nature of healing. It's not just like, well, God heals this person, but he's not going to heal that person because, well, we didn't really cover that on the cross. We might cover her. When you understand that atonement, sorrow, sickness, and death was dealt with in the atonement, then it helps you from a place of faith understand that actually I can lay hands on this person with confidence knowing that God is actually going to do something. I might always get healed, but I know that when I lay hands on this person, I can stand here confidently knowing that God is going to do something for them or we can start the process of taking them through a place of breakthrough. And to this day, I would probably say 75% of the time when we do prayer ministry, whether it's intense prayer ministry or like just praying for people, 75% of the time we get the results. Occasionally, there's sadly there are some that don't, but that 75%, that's pretty good, right? And so you know, all the time we're trying to aim to get that higher, and some of that might come through our lack of understanding. Maybe we're not doing something right, or we're not hearing something right, we haven't quite touched something right. Because I do believe God wants people set free. If, pe- if, God's, if Jesus has taken the time to save somebody, then I don't see why that they should, they should stay in a place of uh, torment in their lives, because that's all covered in the atonement. It doesn't, it used to, it just logically, no, it doesn't make any sense to me anymore. Whereas before I'd be doubting it, but now it's logically, God would save them, but he wants them to stay sick all their life, and he wants them to be mental, in a place of mental anguish all their life. That doesn't seem right. Jesus came to heal and to, and to set free the captivities and to, you know, to give sight to the blind and, break, and heal the brokenhearted. You know, that's the mission of Jesus. Could you just clarify again what you said about divorce, remarriage, and baptism? What do you mean? Oh, right. Okay. Um, I think... Oh, what, from Romans 7? Yeah, so Romans 7. You're Romans 7, verses 1 to 6. Uh, sh- shall I just go through it as an example so we can see it? So as opposed to take my word for it. Let's, let's go to the man himself, Mr. Paul. Um, so Romans 7. Okay, now dear brothers and sisters, this is from verse 1, you who are familiar with the Torah, don't you know that the Torah applies only, okay, big word there, only while a person is alive. Okay, we've got that? So this is legal talk. So the Torah is only effective if the person as long as he's alive. For example, when a woman marries, the law of Torah binds her to her husband as long as he's alive. But if he dies, the, Torah's, the Torah of marriage no longer applies to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she's free from the Torah and does not commit adultery when she re- remarries. Okay, so he's made a case there. Like, where are we going with this, Paul? Then he goes on. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point... You died to the power of the Torah when you died with Christ. How did we die with Christ? Because Romans 6 teaches us about baptism. Romans 6 is the baptism, it's kind of like passage if you want to like understand about baptism. Because when we go into the ground, we die with him. When we come out, out of the waters, we are made into a new creation. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. For when we were controlled by our old nature... Uh, sinful desires were at work within us and the Torah aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we've been released from the Torah for we died to it we are no, and, we are, and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God not in the old way of obeying the letter of the Torah but in the new way of the living in the spirit. And that's really what he's teaching here. Romans 6, baptism is the key to death and life 
and Romans 7 is teaching you about how do you get from under Torah and into this new covenant, because there are two covenants running side by side. But if those two covenants are running side by side and you jump from one to the other but nothing's died, then you are guilty of adultery. That's his argument. So that the only way that you can make this work is somebody needs to die if you want to jump from that to that, from one husband to the next husband. And so he's saying that through baptism in Romans 6 and through death in Christ and being raised up again to new life and being born again and made in the image of the second Adam and you're becoming a new creation, Torah doesn't have power over anymore. You've jumped from that track to that track. So the two tracks run side by side, but you're no longer condemned by that one. And that's when it says in Romans 8, verse 1, therefore there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus anymore, because the Torah can't condemn you, because you're not under it anymore. Does that answer your question? Because you said about remarriage and baptism. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to... This Bible hasn't got all my markings, so I can't immediately find the ones about... Um, yeah, okay, so... But chapter 6, well then, should we keep on sinning so God can show us more and more his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So that's his theology, saying through baptism, this is why baptism is more important than I think a lot of modern day evangelicals really realize. They think, oh, it's, just, it's just a ritual we do. It's necessary, but you know, it's just what we do. No, it is quintessential, a key component. If you want to get someone off that live rail over there and into that live rail without committing adultery, someone's got to die, and it has to be you, and it has to be through Christ and the waters of baptism. Amen? And that's another thing that I do. I would say to people, Christians that are going through ministry, have you been baptized? Why is this important to me? Because I remind the demons that at that day when they got baptized, that's when all their hold, all their authority, their accusational powers was dealt with. And they can't do it anymore. So when that person came out of the waters, they became a new creation. Therefore, whatever condemnation or whatever curses or family generational stuff that's stuck on them has no legal right, no legal authority. So baptism for me is a real big, biggie to like legally deal with the devil because the devil's a lawyer and he knows exactly how to play the book. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Any, any others? One, yep. Okay. Sorry, Bible. So, simple question, but following on from that, if you've got somebody who's um, a believer being baptized and has, has, has adhered to, to that covenant really and joined into that, can they be demon possessed? And therefore, as leaders, how do we encourage people or enable people to protect themselves and be aware, I suppose, to, to not just keep themselves safe, but keep themselves um, in the spirit of God, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. There is a warning here. Forgive me if I can find it. it answers that question. I'm not sure if it's in First Corinthians six or Second Corinthians six. I'll just just quick just bear with me one minute. Um, no, I think Second Corinthians six. Because the question is, can a Christian get demon-possessed? Now, there's some goofy theology out there that says, no, once you become a Christian, you've got no demons inside you. Okay, take it from someone who was an ex-witch. Uh, when I came to Christ, I was fully born again, I was filled with his Holy Spirit, and I had quite a few demons stuck inside of me. Would I therefore say it's then once someone is saved, can they get demon-possessed? Now, what people don't often differentiate between is demon-possession versus demon-oppression. A lot of Christians, I think, get demonically oppressed, which is from the outside affecting them. But, I, uh, but as for a Christian that's like really on fire for Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, I think you, you're just like, it's, it's, it's not only impossible to get demon-possessed unless you start moving into things like you would know are dark and evil and sinister. Um, you know, you'll get yourself into a world of trouble there. Uh, where are we? Um, yeah, here we go. So this is, this is from... Pauline doctrine. This is New Testament doctrine, okay? Um, he says, And uh, what union can there be between uh, God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore come out from among them 
uh, among those unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and, you, and I will welcome you and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body and spirit. So some Christians say, oh, nothing can defile the spirit. Well, that's not what Paul says. Things can defile your spirit and even defile your flesh as well. He says, so things can defile our body and spirit and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. So if you're putting yourself into a situation uh, where, for example, I don't know, this is just immediately coming to mind, say like you're, you're a Christian and you want to smoke ganja, right? Uh, weed, whatever. You, what's, what's the street term for it these days? Gan- not ganja, marijuana. It's my, sem- my 70s street, s- street talk coming out here. Okay. Um, you know, so if you want to like do that and, um, I don't know, put yourself around guys where you smoke that stuff all day and listening to Bob Marley and all that kind of stuff, you are probably defiling the flesh and potentially defiling your spirit and you can open yourselves up to something quite nasty, demonic. I have known a guy who was a Holy Spirit-filled guy, loved Jesus, had no problems. He had fornication, sex outside of marriage with a witch. And then suddenly, after that, he was seeing things. Um, he was being plagued by all kinds of stuff. Because he basically, as Paul says, where, he said, would you take the body of Christ and join it to a harlot? He literally took the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit and joined it with Baal. And, and then you wonder why that guy was seeing things and had demonic, was being played by demonic spirits. He phoned me up. I, I literally had to tell him, oh, that sounds horrible, I had to tell him off being such an idiot. I said, you do know what you've just done. Because, you see, when, when you have sex with someone outside of marriage, you, get, you know we've got sexually transmitted diseases, you can get sexually, spiritually transmitted diseases. And that's what he got. He got an SSSD. You know, he got something from this witch, and he got some of what some of the demons that she had in her he became one flesh with her and therefore he joined in her house so to speak and his holy temple got polluted so yes in answer to your question christians can get demon possessed if they really go out of their way and do something stupid um and christians can get demon oppressed either through things of the past uh, that haven't been dealt with or by putting themselves again into silly situations. I mean, even things like, uh, I, knew, I knew a Christian lady, I'm just thinking about this because you pointed out in my car the other day, um, yeah, well, maybe I should throw away. Anyway, I, knew, I knew a Christian lady, she, she just listened to Pink Floyd all the time. <laughs> I said, thank God my car the other day, there was a Pink Floyd album there, she said, what's that doing there? And I was like, oh, oh I can explain. Um, so, and she was listening to Pink Floyd all the time, and it just made her depressed, and just made her open to this kind of deep oppression. Um, she got rid of that, we prayed for her, and she's fine after that, completely no problems at all. So Christians can open themselves up to some dangerous stuff. But yeah, it's a good question, I like it, yeah. Um, I might be being picky here. But is it right to say demon possession as opposed to demon demonized? Are we not possessed by the Holy Spirit once we believe us? Yes. But like I just pointed out to you, that you see, this is this is where theology um, or our theology, which you see, our Western theology is a little bit simplistic. Where your your, your argument is, which I hear a lot. Well, I'm fine filled. I don't know. If I'm maybe putting words in your mouth. Are you saying that because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, therefore I can't be possessed by any other spirit? As in possession being a whole thing. Yeah. Well. The, <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. So, again, there will be some schools of thought in Christianity saying, well, no, once you've got the Holy Spirit inside you, you're sealed with the Spirit, you feel the Spirit, there is no room for another demon to come in there. But that just isn't the case. Like I've just given you a couple of examples. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, when it comes to sanctification, which is what this passage is here talking about here, where you've got to keep yourselves clean, You've got to keep your cells clean. In Revelation, you've got to wash your own garments. You've got to sort your own life out. Jesus is there with the power through the Spirit to sanctify you, make you holy, but you've got to work with that. But if you're not going to work with that and you're going to be worldly, then you open yourself up to all the same fruits that the world has to, to eat of and enjoy, and you'll get the same results that the world will have. So... Can Christians get possessed? I think they would have to do something pretty extreme to do it, like like that guy did have sex with a witch, and then you know, pretty obvious that's going to happen. Um, but yeah, it can happen. It, it just it shouldn't happen. Theologically, it would be nice if we could tick that box and say it will never happen. But it just it's just not it's just it's not reality. It just doesn't work out like that. Hang on. I was just saying, is that the expression used, dying to flesh? 
yeah, if you walk in in the flesh, it's uh, it's um, it's death. If you walk in the spirit, it's life and peace. You know, who wouldn't want life and peace? Who wants to go back to the days of death and all that nonsense and all the drama that goes with it, where every day is like an episode of EastEnders? Yeah, I want that. Thank you very much. Okay, one more. Qu- go on. Yeah, go on, Nick. <laughs> What's the, um, what would you say the difference is, if you will, between healing ministries and people operating in the gift of healing versus these, like, quote-unquote, ordinary ministries? Surely wherever the, the Spirit of God is and the message of the cross is, there should be healings as a byproduct. Is it similar to sort of prophesying versus being a prophet, or, like... Yeah, so the question, I guess that's a good question. So, like, you get some people that have, like, a real... You, you don't see so much of it today. It was like... I mean, you do, but not in this country. Back in the 50s and 60s, there used to be, like, loads of tent crusades, and you get these evangelists, and you get what they call healing evangelists, so their focus was very much on healing and signs and wonders. And it was those signs and wonders that actually did the evangelism for them. They just, like, people saw miracles right in front of their eyes. People like All Roberts and stuff like that, and Billy Sunday, people like that come to mind. You know, so, yeah, and that, that was their calling that was their anointing but i would put them under the evangelism bracket in the fivefold ministry so with evangelists some evangelists like like uh, billy graham they're just preachers of the word some evangelists people like all roberts and things like that in the day they were good preachers but they were anointed to do healing and signs and wonders and, and that was just a quirky part of their ministry and so yeah in answer to your question all of us should be doing our bit by, if someone needs prayer, to lay hands on them and stuff, because we're all priests unto God, we can all administer that. But there does seem to be certain individuals that God calls out and separates, like, yeah, you're going to do this as a living, you're going to do this as a ministry, this is going to be your thing. And that individual might not be called to, like, travel the nations, he might just live in gospel, and he just goes around churches and that's his ministry and stuff. So, but, it, but, but, but yeah, I do believe that God separates some people out for what I would call more unusual works of power. Like you said, the difference between a prophet and a gift, someone has a gift of prophecy. They're almost two different worlds, similar in some respects, but very different as well. That's a good question, yeah. Did I answer it for you? Yeah. Uh, cl- oh, go, on. go on, Claire, you had to add. I was only going to add to the music. Um, I, I actually saw a prophecy the other day that the devil, who was worshipper, um, is actually going to infect secular music, which you can kind of see anyway, um, but literally demonise a lot of people in one hit. Uh, that's happened loads of times in history already. I mean, I'll give you an example is the Beatles. So the hysteria that was produced through their music, I mean, that's, that's demonic. I mean, you, I don't, you ever seen it? You've seen the footage of their hysteria. Just Peter, I mean, it's like when Hitler used to walk by people. People were just hysterical about the guy. You know, they didn't understand why they were doing what they were doing. It's just like something came over them and stuff. So, so yeah, so music has that power. Uh, if you watch, uh, I know it sounds a bit, bit out the, but on the edge, but there's loads of footage uh, of people filming pop stars at, at these gigs and stuff, at these big, big, huge events, and their phones glitch out. It happens all the time, and then suddenly, when I say all the time, so many people have captured this footage where the people on stage, their faces disappear, and they're replaced with demonic faces on their phones. They even like they're showing. It's like they, they, there's no way that the phone could like just re-alter those faces and do what they did. So that happens a lot. So mus- the music industry is demonic, and it, and it is evil, and it's designed to keep people blind. It's designed to make them have fornication outside of marriage. It's designed to do everything they can to profane the name of God. And one of the reasons why sex outside of marriage is so big is because it's a constant kick in the face to the Trinity of God. The marriage is man, woman coming together, which represents the Christ and the church, and God in the centre of that covenant is God the Father in that triunity. And so every time people have sex outside of marriage, it's literally like a fingers up to the Holy Trinity. So we're going to blaspheme your, your image. We're going to blaspheme you. And so that's why the, the pop industry pushes it so aggressively. Because it's, and that's why I know from the fact that witches, if they wanted to do things to certain individuals, that especially the Christians, find Christians in a certain area, they'll get people in the shape of a pentagon having sex around their house in fornication so that it gives them demonic power so they can bring curses to Christians. The Christians don't know this. They don't understand the power of demonically sex outside of marriage does. It's really dangerous. Uh, and Christians don't know. They say, oh, it doesn't really matter. We love each other. It's like, no, it's not. It's, it's bad. It's, it's really bad news. Um, yeah, so you know, that cheers you up, isn't it? So uh, is that it? 
Good. Okay. Well, thank you, Jesus, uh, for tonight, Lord God. I thank you that you've given us plenty of things to think about, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, even though what we've looked at is quite dark and serious, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the one that sets the captives free, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you've given your church the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you commissioned the church to go into all the world to baptize them and to make disciples and to lay hands on the sick and to cast out demons and to raise the dead. Lord, we thank you, Lord, you commissioned your church to go and do the same things that you did, Lord Jesus, to do that Luke 4 ministry, Lord God, where you came to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up those people, Lord God, and to set at liberty those who are captives and, and to restore the sight to the blind. This is the ministry of Christ, and I thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us, your church. I pray you teach us, I pray you use us for your glory to push against the, the forces of darkness, Lord God, that in these days and in this hour, Lord Jesus, you will take the treasures of Satan, Lord Jesus, and turn them in order into treasures of grace, and may they be the stones that make up the new holy temple in the New Jerusalem. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. And it's all for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Go forth and cast out the devil and heal the sick and raise the dead.